So let's uh, begin uh, with uh, Rob Serra. Welcome here. Thank you very much. Uh, going to uh, quickly go over a couple of different points. Uh, first, my background and uh, then uh, my transformation from a Marine into an anti-war activist. And uh, third, I'm going to quickly go over the situation that is taking place now uh, in Iraq and, uh, and what the troops are, are up to. Um, I, uh, I was in the Marine Corps for nine years. Uh, was going to be a career Marine. Uh, January 2003, uh, I was deployed to Iraq, um, and uh, we got over there, or we were heading over, uh, left on ship from San Diego January 17th. 90% um, of my platoon, I was a platoon guy, uh, it's 30 in command of a platoon of 32 Marines. 90% uh, of my platoon were kids that were eight, or 19 to 21 years old, and they'd been in the Marine Corps about six months. Uh, they went through boot camp, infantry school, and we were the first unit. Uh, on the way over, um, first of all, uh, I was 31 and saw things a little differently uh, than most of the other guys. Um, I bought into why we were going. Uh, we were told, hey, look, there was mass destruction. They were actually going to trap the United States. Uh, and Saddam Hussein needs to be stopped, and there are also terrorists there. So we were sold on that. And as Marines, it was, it was what we did. It was the Super Bowl for us. It was time to go to war. We were going to be heroes. Uh, a lot of these kids had no idea where Iraq was. So one of the first things I did on a ship on the way over was give a geography lesson. And uh, we were all psyched. Um, our commanders told us that first things first, we're in attack force. We get to Baghdad. Once we're in Baghdad, we're going home. So home is through Baghdad. <coughs> Uh, we had, uh, once we hit the deck in, uh, in Kuwait, we had some supply problems. Things started unraveling slowly already. Uh, first of all, we only had about 170,000 troops there. And to anyone who knows anything about the military and invasions, that wasn't going to be enough to occupy the country and win the peace. Uh, secondly, we had supply problems. Uh, the armored vests that we had, uh, we didn't have enough inserts for, these, uh, for the armored vests, the Kevlar inserts that go on the front and the back. Uh, we were giving up uh, plates from the back of our vests to give the guys who didn't have any at all. Um, so once we crossed the border, everything was starting to kind of come together. Um, we were in it for the long haul, we knew it. It's good to cross the border, uh, March 21st, no resistance. We weren't catching any resistance at all. Uh, we got 54 miles into the country, and there was nothing going on, we didn't see a soul. And we figured, okay, we're doing well. This is what's supposed to happen. We heard about some Republican Guard guys getting taken out to our right by the 7th Marines. The first real battle we had was in An Nasiriyah. Um, there was a Marine battalion that got pinned down inside of this city. Uh, they were fighting urban warfare. And we were told, look, your unit's going to punch through and get to the other side of An Nasiriyah and keep heading for Baghdad. What we didn't know at the time was that inside An Nasiriyah, the guys that were fighting the Marines were these Fedayeen, um, what they call the Saddam Fedayeen. They all wore civilian clothes. It's what you're seeing now. Uh, they were pretty much freedom fighters. The Republican Guard had kind of disappeared, and they, they dissipated throughout the country. Um, in al we ran into what are called free fire zones. They said, look, anything that moves, kill it. Man, woman, dog, child, cat, whatever, shoot it. So that's what we were doing. And as we continued further north through the country, we kept doing the same thing. Uh, I was involved, and, and this was my, this, I'm going to get into my turning point. Uh, my turning point in the war came in uh, a town called Ashaka. Uh, it was north of Anasaria. Uh, we'd been in a firefight. We'd done what's called a, pretty much a drive-by. We'd pull up and open fire on a, on a town while the rest of the convoy drove by uh, to secure the road. So we've been in a firefight, we've taken some fire from this town, and uh, there was a, uh, a report of suicide bombers in the area. As I'm sitting there, this woman comes out of the town. She's wearing a uh, black uh, burqa and carrying a bag under her arm. And she was walking towards a marine vehicle about 200 yards away from me. So as she's walking out, the marines in the vehicle start yelling at her, putting their hands up, telling her to stop. She kept coming forward. She got within about 150 yards of the vehicle, and I made a decision. I said, look, 
one of two things is going to happen. She's going to walk up in this vehicle and explode because she's not stopping, or I'm going to take a shot at her and put her down. She continued to walk. I had a free shot. I took two, I took two shots at her. The first shot hit her. As the second shot went off, and this is all happening split second. As the second shot went off, the other Marines in this vehicle opened up on her. They hit her with machine guns, M16s, 40 millimeter grenades. And as she fell, she was pulling a white flag out of her bag. So at this point, I threw my weapon down and started crying. I was like, what, what the hell just happened? Why are we here? Who are we fighting? I started questioning everything. Two days later, we were north, uh, and we were told there was a Marine that was missing in Ashaja from another unit. Hadn't heard from him, didn't know if he was dead or alive, had no idea where he was. We were told, look, my lieutenant came up to us and said, our company is going to be the lead for the battalion to go back into Ashatra and find this Marine. And at that point is where I failed. Fell apart. I looked at my lieutenant and I said, sir, I'm not going back in there. I don't know what we're doing, but if we go back in there, the Marine's going to die. And for what? These people just got shot at. They're civilians we killed. They're not going to be happy. I was relieved, but continued on as a, as a Marine, as an infantryman, and, and fought my way the rest of the way to Baghdad. Once we got into Baghdad, um, instead of being in a huge fight, we were met with flowers, we were met with cartons of cigarettes, people cheering. And this went on for up until the 16th, um, when we were getting ready to head down south to a town called Hilla. But the weirdest thing about being in Baghdad was that once we pulled in, our commanders were on radios talking to higher headquarters and saying, what do we do now? So not only did we have enough troops, all of a sudden we had no extra plan, no idea what to do. Uh, we moved south to Al-Hilla, and they said, after you guys are down in Al-Hilla, you'll go home. Well, while we were in Hilla, this was April now, while we were in Hilla, they said, oh yeah, by the way, we're staying until September. The situation's changed. This kept happening. Dates being bumped back. We all felt like we had done our job. This is happening to troops there now. Uh, while we were in Hilla, my mind started changing even more. We were providing security and patrolling neighborhoods for what I call the haves. People that had nice houses. People that had gates. People that had electricity. Meanwhile, out in town, there were people living in slums, living in squalor, who had no running water, no electricity. We weren't patrolling their neighborhoods. We were looking for Alibaba, as they called him. They didn't want thieves coming in and taking what they had. Uh, I came home uh, in June of 2003. I was sent home for recruiting duty. And when I got home, my orders were bumped back uh, from uh, July until October. Then they were bumped back again until January 2004. Uh, I went to re-enlist and become a Marine recruiter in January. And when I re-enlisted, when I went to re-enlist, all of a sudden I was hit with, wait a second, something happened in Iraq to you. You failed as a combat leader. So my battalion commander told me that I'm gonna let you re-enlist for two years instead of four and go back to Iraq so you can redeem yourself as a leader. I looked my commander in the eye and said, sir, I'm gonna officially request Max. I wanted to go over his head and speak to the regimental commander, maybe someone with a little more gumption. Uh, regimental commander kind of gave me the same story, but he put it in more of a fatherly tone. And he asked me if I lost my edge, and I said yes. And he said, all right, you think, you know, you've done nine years. What do you think? Time, time to cash it in or what? And at that point, yeah, I conceded. And I said, you know what, if I go back to Iraq, I'll probably end up getting somebody killed. So I got out. Once I got out, I was still wrestling with what had happened in Iraq. Uh, my first month home, I'd been drinking heavily and was getting in fights and things like that. Um, but started to question why we were in Iraq. I was also questioning why the rest of my unit, since they got home in September, were heading back in May to Iraq. Because Marines aren't sent in unless something's really bad. Um, so all of this led me to get into the anti-war effort. Uh, I figured as a guy who's been there, as someone who can convey what's going on and get it from the troops' point of view, that I can be more of an educator and let people know exactly what the hell's going on over there. Uh, I got in touch with Mike Hoffman, uh, who was starting a group called Iraq Veterans Against the War. Um, I also worked with Vietnam Veterans Against the War and Vets for Peace, and they helped us out. Uh, we started in 
July of this year. And uh, since then, uh, we started with eight members. We marched in New York at the Republican National Convention and protested. While we were there, we gained more members. So we had 30 by the end of that week. Right now, we're at 80. We're in contact with guys that are in Iraq. What we want to do is make sure when these guys come home, they've got someone to talk to, first of all. Second of all, well, actually, the first point is we want this war to end. We want to get these guys home. This, point, this war is pointless. We uh, basically, as we all know, the situation in Iraq is, is getting worse. Um, my unit that went back, I've lost seven guys that I knew since they've been back, since they've gone back over there. Uh, one of my units was directly involved in fighting in Fallujah. One of my friends was wounded twice and is still there. Uh, so in closing, uh, what I'd like to say is we are working our asses off to get in touch with more vets, welcome these guys when they come home, give them a place to go, educate everyone out here so you can spread the word as well. Forget what Fox News is saying, forget what CNN is saying, take it from our mouths. It's a bad situation. We got used and we wanted to end. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to address uh, the question about supporting the, about supporting the troops. Um, we always say you can support the warrior, not the war. All right. I think the two are a completely different thing. The troops are one thing. The war itself is another. Granted, they are combined. But you've got the guys over there who are victims of policy. All right. Anyone in a college who hasn't been there, all right, for someone like me, and I'm talking to a college kid who says, well, you know, I actually support this war, and I say, well, okay, how many of your family members are in it? How many friends have you lost? When was the last time you picked up a weapon instead of post? Have you been shot at? Have you killed anybody? No. Until you see the real reality of combat, you have no idea. So I suggest he goes back and talks to someone who's been there. Um, as far as, and I'll make it quickly, as far as them supporting the troops, you know, what are the, sending letters, sending cookies, say hey, that's all well and good. And you know, telling the guys, hey, we love you, that's fine. Guys love getting that stuff over there. The last thing about, if you speak out against the war, you're demoralizing the troops. All these guys care about in Fallujah, in Baghdad, in Najaf, all they care about is the guy next to them getting the mission accomplished and getting the hell home. A lot of people really think that politics plays a lot on what's going on over there. It doesn't. These guys don't care about things like that. I think news about JLo being dead brought more than, you know, when is the war going to end for these kids? Okay? They're worried about the guy next to them. That's what it's down to. It's down to survival for these guys. It doesn't matter who sent them, they're already there. They just want to get the hell home. Okay, thanks.